Good morning all. It's uh, half ten now so I thought I uh, may as well start. Um, welcome and thank you all for attending the Evidence Network for Renting's inaugural event. Um, it was supposed to be here in Manchester but as obviously with the COVID-19 um, pandemic we've not been able to have our in-face conference. Hopefully that will be um, later in either this year or early next year um, and hopefully we'll have you all there. Um, what I'd like to do is ask each member of the panel if they would be able to uh, give a short um, introduction to themselves and their paper and then move on to the next one. So uh, Kim, would you like to go first? Thanks Tom. Hi, uh, I'm Kim McKee. I'm a Senior Lecturer and Head of Housing at the University of Stirling uh, and I'm also a co-investigator in the UK Club at Centre for Housing Evidence. Um, I guess broadly speaking I'm interested in housing inequalities and over the last um, seven or eight years a lot of that work has been focused around the private rented sector um, mainly looking at issues facing young people, um, low income groups, um, uh, migrants uh, and more recently uh, turning our focus to middle aged private renters and this is what the paper was focusing on um, in the presentation I gave <coughs> today. So if you didn't get a chance to um, see this the, the presentation that I pre-recorded for today's event. Essentially what we're talking about was drawing attention to the issue, issues around intergenerational housing inequalities and intragenerational housing inequalities that it's you know a lot of the media perception and, and, and what you see in the papers is a focus on millennials, generation rent and that is a really important issue but there's also other age groups grappling with challenges in the private rented sector and I guess our work's just trying to draw attention to that and get to get people to think about um, intra as well as intergenerational inequalities um, and, and try moving beyond pitting age groups against each other. Okay, thanks. Thanks Kim. And uh, Martin, would you like to go next? Hi Martin, I think your, your mic's on mute. That old trick. <coughs> There's always one, isn't there? <laughs> uh, okay, so my name's Martin Farley and I'm, I live in Brighton um, and I'm not a housing sector specialist at all and um, I'm a member of the Green Party and my focus has really been on a lot of work to do with financing, particularly public financing, how government raises its revenue, how it spends it um, and I've been involved in lots of aspects of Green Party policy including, if you saw it at the general election, like the Green New Deal um, uh, and other uh, ways in which we can sort of improve society generally using um, public sector financing and uh, the proposal that we're looking at at the moment and it's actually it's not specifically just within the Green Party. I, I, I am sort of working on it with other external sort of folk as well. Um, is really how we use the current situation to transform the private um, rental sector into public and social housing that's of better quality, secure tenure, and of course, lower rents. So um, there are specific reasons why that's um, more possible now than it has been before. Um, and there's a particular approach to it that we think potentially would work. So I'd be very interested to get people's feedback or questions, or if you want to punch holes in that, um, in this session, then that would be great. Thank you, Martin. And Amy, would you like to go next? Um, I'm Amy Clare from the University of Essex. I'm a research fellow. Um, my research really focuses on the relationship between housing and health. So my presentation was a summary of some of the work that I've done on that that's most appropriate for the current situation so sort of looking at how reductions in the local housing allowance has affected private renters um, mental health their experience of the homes they can afford things like that and then um, a paper we did on housing precariousness which was trying to encourage a move away from focusing on single aspects of housing to take a broader approach so we don't end up tackling one problem but creating another ideally that was the idea anyway. Thank you, Amy. And uh, Ken, would you like to introduce yourself now? Thanks, Tom. My name's Ken Gibb. I'm the director of the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence at Glasgow. And for the second time in a fortnight, I'm doing a webinar just as my window cleaners turned up and started spraying the windows all around my house. So I hope that won't cause too big a, an externality as, as we go along. So my, my, my paper is about a uh, an evidence review that we've been doing at CASH uh, alongside my colleague Adriana, who's, who's on the call, and Alex Marsh, which is a kind of evidence review of uh, the rent control lit, lit, lit literature. My paper is about the, uh, 
econometric modeling in particular in the last 20, 20 years. And I think those of you who have seen my video will recognize that early morning times, I simply can't multitask at all. I can just about talk in a coherent way, but I couldn't work out how to turn things on and off very efficiently, but we got there in the end. So uh, yeah, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm about today. Thank you, Ken. And uh, Sarah, would you like to introduce yourself as well, please? Hi. Hi, yes. Um, I'm Sarah Rowe. I'm a senior policy officer with the Homelessness Organisation Crisis. And my colleague, Chris Hancock, also presents our paper with me, and he'll be available this afternoon for the Q&A. Uh, and our focus is on um, looking at the potential role of, of the mediated private rented sector to uh, provide settled housing for some of the 15,000 people brought um, into emergency accommodation as part of the government's Everyone In programme. Um, and talking about the unprecedented opportunity we have now um, to, to invest in expanding both um, social rented housing through an acquisitions programme, but particularly in this paper, looking at the potential to grow um, the social lettings agency sector and other similar mediations such as help to rent schemes um, with, with specific interventions from government so that, so that we can provide um, people who have come in from the street often for the first time with a pathway straight into settled permanent housing. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, before I open up the questions um, to, the to the panel from people on the call, um, if anyone does have a question, please just use the raise the hand function. Um, there is quite a lot of people in there, so and I'll be able to find it. Um, but first, I've had a question in from Bridget at the Nationwide Foundation, and she's asking, there is an increasing evidence of the health impacts of poor housing, conditions, affordability, security. This includes increased costs of the health system, Yet we don't see enough of this evidence used for why investment in decent housing is not only the right thing, but the financially prudent thing. How do we shift this? Um, anybody on the panel wants to start first? Perhaps Kim? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. I think there are some issues there around how can we, um, you know, make the case about preventative spend. And I guess that's the point Bridget's getting at, you know, that it would make sense to... Um, have good quality housing to avoid these then knock on impacts on kind of health and mental health that ultimately cost the NHS um, a lot of money in the, in the long run. So I think there's a there's probably a question there about how are we, um, you know, what language are we using in presenting the evidence? Who are we talking to? Who are we presenting the evidence to? Maybe there's some space there for some different conversations with different policy and practice actors than maybe the housing community is traditionally been engaging with. So I think there's some... Uh, things that we need to think through a wee bit more, definitely. Thank you, Kim. Um, Amy, do you have any thoughts as well? I mean, I think perhaps we could view what's happening now as an opportunity to shift that language. I think the language is hugely important. We talk about housing as an investment, we talk about um, properties and things like that. We don't talk about homes enough. Um, I think maybe the safe home language, we can use that and jump on that to try and encourage policy makers in particular to think about home in a more broad way and, and, and to recognise the importance it has because we're really seeing now how much it's got a role in um, health and then also children's education now so hopefully some good may come from this. Thank you Amy. Uh, Martin do you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah I, I do sort of touch upon this in, in the video presentation I submitted and the challenge here I think is that you know, who is making the decision to improve these homes? And if it's the owner of the homes, in, in, in terms of the private rented sector, that means absentee landlords who have no immediate sort of um, benefit from making the improvement. Um, they have no initial incentive. Now, government, for example, could provide incentives, could provide subsidies, tax breaks, all sorts of things. But you only have to walk around the private rented sector to see the very poor repair, uh, state of repair, much of it uh, is in. I've been renting for 30 years and I don't think I've ever known any landlord to do more than the most cursory kind of maintenance of the property. So I think the real challenge for us and one of the, the members of our little group that's, that's looking at our proposal um, is involved in retrofit. And he said that, the, you know, that it's the private rental sector. That's the, it's, a, it's the one sector of the housing market that's really tough to get them 
to kind of insulate the homes properly because the people who would benefit the renters have no power in this negotiation and the people with the power have no real interest and i think if we are ever to get to a point where a lot of this very poor quality housing is upgraded we need to sort of redistribute that power somehow we need to find a way to give renters control to give renters rights to demand certain levels of um uh, quality of housing um, and until we do that, I think we're not going to get much, you know, government can throw as much money as it wants at private landlords, but unless we actually force them to kind of meet sort of higher standards and give um, tenants the ability to, to make these decisions, I think it's almost certainly never going to happen. Thank you, Martin. Um, Ken, do you have any? Yeah, I, I mean, pre preventive spending is a really interesting uh, theme and, and, and topic, and there's been a lot of good work done across the public services about particularly the barriers to acknowledging how you how you do something about preventive spending, which relates to, on the one hand, the, the rational incentives of individual parts of the public services and the sense that what, whereas one part may benefit, it's often another part that pays for it. So unfortunately, there are you know, within organisational divisions, quite logical reasons why why people don't play ball, and it's also there's also evidence I think that there's not much incentive within individual organisations to actually, uh, you know, invest in in, in pre pre prevention. People don't get rewarded for it in different parts of work. So, in in my previous life working in What Works Scotland, we we did a lot of research on trying to overcome the, the barriers to preventive spending, and unfortunately. It varies hugely from department, from sector to to, to sec sector. Just last year, Ahuri in Australia published a really interesting series of reports about how to expand investment in social housing and making the economic case for that. And one of their arguments was that you could you could account explicitly for for the uh, savings that other budgets would make. But uh, you know, that's quite a challenge because you know senior civil servants in other areas would, would be saying, "Do we want our area to be having these savings in our budgets?" You know, even so, even though everybody's on site and signed up to these clear preventive logical chains, it's actually quite a hard thing to make in practice on a consistent basis. And housing doesn't have a good uh, history, apart from the very broad sense of you know public health externalities was the original reason for housing intervention you know in the early 20th century but we're actually generally not very good at good good at it i don't think thank you ken that's very interesting and uh, sarah do you have any thoughts yeah i mean just to echo what others have said this, this um is a, a really important opportunity for us all to to try and increase the the, the focus on the um, health impacts and potential um, savings um, of investing in good quality housing. Um, it's certainly an issue that we've tried to um, shine a light on in the context of homelessness. Uh, in 2018, Crisis published a, a document which set out uh, strategies for each national government in Great Britain um, to, to take steps needed to end homelessness in each nation. And one of the things that we did was um, commission PricewaterhouseCoopers to look at the cost benefits of investment in, in um, ending homelessness. And, and we found that, for, or they found that for every pound spent, um, £2.80 um, is generated in benefits, which were partly associated with people's improved health and well-being. Um, so, you know, as Ken said, there's lots of evidence out there, um, but the challenge now is to make sure that we, we don't lose this opportunity to, to, to um, keep the focus on it and um, to learn from governments like the Scottish Government that have, have focused on, on the health impacts of good quality housing and looked at the, the longer term potential um, and benefits of in, investing in that. Thank you, Sarah. Um, do if anyone's got any comments, do put them in the chat as well. I've, there is some there already um, on there for you. I think uh, Martin to respond to. Um, does anybody uh, on the wider chat on the floor have any uh, questions they'd like to ask? Craig, I think you've got one, haven't you? Tom, good morning. Um, yeah, I've got several. I, I don't know where to start. Um, so I've, I've had a hectic morning. I've watched 
all the presentations just just in time. Um, I thought they were great. This is working really well. Well done, Tom, for putting this together. Um, uh, so some, can I just can I throw out some quick ones um, for Kim? Um, really, it's a really important paper about aging. Um, you make the point home has never been more important. Um, I'd like to hear you say a bit more about that. Um, Amy, um, I've read your work before. Brilliant. Really, really important stuff. Um, I was really interested in, in the, the housing precariousness measure. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about, a, a little bit more about that and how you've controlled for the variables and how you can demonstrate that you're not simply um, measuring um, the, the kind of social gradient in health, that, that tenure is important. Um, and for Martin, can I ask a third question? Is that okay, Tom? I'm going to keep going. For, for Martin, um, do you think landlords will bite? Um, if, if I was a landlord uh, and I was being given the, the chance to um, cash in, um, I'd want to know that I'd have kind of a good return on my investment elsewhere. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've thought about that, but that was my kind of instant reaction, which is, well, how's this going to work? So those are my three impressionistic questions. Thank you, Craig. Um, shall we start with Kim? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really good question, Craig. I think um, home is something um, we've been thinking about for a while in the work we've been doing in the private rented sector. So some of the work um, I've written with colleagues, Adriana, Zoe Tech Glasgow and, and Jenny Houlihan um, at Cardiff. So the projects we've been involved with in, with the last few years in the private rented sector, homes really came out as quite a strong theme. Um, and there's a number of different dimensions to this, I think. So there's the issue around tenure security, you know, for people to feel settled to put down roots, you know, making a home is, is really important to them. So tenure security is, is a thing for me and how that connects with homemaking and can positive connotations at home and also the reverse of that, what that means for people who don't have that tenure and security, who don't have that tenure security and are in a more precarious position. Um, but I think home now is, is, has become so important. We're spending so much time there, and I guess that's the added COVID dimension. You know, it's it's, it's increasingly becoming for some of us our, our workplaces. Um, it's where we're homeschooling our kids. It's where we're, we're doing all the leisure. Um, so there's a lot of, it's been used for a lot of different things at the moment, lots of different purpose, purposes. It's a busy space, you know, there's a lot of pressure on it. So actually home and the security that home brings is I don't think it's ever been so important, and I think there's been a lot of lot of um, research in the last few years around the, the connections between home and, and, and mental health and well-being, um, and that goes back some years I think into the literature. So I think those links are quite well demonstrated, and I think going back to the the first question about health again, you can see the kind of links between housing and health quite strongly. I think when we think about home um, and to go back to the age dimension I was talking about in my own presentation um, for older people as well home for older private renters home is, is, is really important you know aging in the private rented sector is likely to become a much more common experience for more and more people but as a sector it's not really that well geared up to cope with aging bodies and, and some of the issues and the tensions around home making in the PRS for older people um, so I think there's more work we need to do around that as well. And indeed, the, I've got a new project kicking off with um, Tom's involved in and, and Jenny Houlihan at Cardiff, funded by um, Safety Proposals at Scotland, Charitable Trust. And it's going to be looking uh, to develop an evidence review, which will feed into a kind of guidance, leaflet's guidance for landlords about how they can help, you know, their tenants make a home. So I think there's, there is interest there from... Um, you know, landlords, you know, they are thinking about these issues. I think that there's work we could do to, um, you know, raise kind of education about the things landlords could do that would help tenants, you know, things like tenure and security, thinking about personalisation, pets, well-being, issues around energy and heating, lots and lots of themes coming out of the literature. But I think maybe it's kind of linked to that first point, about how we communicate all that evidence that's there. What's the language we're using? Who are we speaking to? Are we communicating it to the right people? You know, as the sector... Kind of aware of all this body of evidence that's really been grown over the last five, ten years. So I think there's there's things for us to do as researchers to think about how are we communicate that, who are we speaking to, how can we kind of summarise and help people digest all the evidence that's been done. Some really great research that's been done in the last decade that involved the and quantitative about home and the PRS. So I think um I think I think these are some of the themes we'll maybe unpack a little bit more in the next 
um, in the time I've got left in this session and I'm sure the rest of the day. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. And just to add, um, Susan from Homes for Good, um, a social enterprise sort of landlord letting agency, will be doing the presentation at 2 p.m., which will also probably discuss some of those issues around what uh, private landlords can be doing to sort of increase that sort of, uh, sort of notion of home in the private rental sector. Um, Martin, would you like to go next to answer Craig's question? Uh, yeah, can I just very quickly also answer sort of Brian's question in the chat um, about sort of, you know, the, the standard of private sector landlords versus public sector. Um, you know, around a third of private sector rentals are sort of viewed to be substandard, and I would suggest that's much higher than in the, the public sector. I don't deny there might be some public landlords who are not as good as they should be. In my own local authority, um, last year they spent on average £2,800 um, on maintenance for um, uh, every, uh, pub, uh, every um, council home uh, in, in the authority area. So I would imagine that's substantially more than your average um, buy to let landlord would, would spend. But I think the, the, the data does suggest that private sector rental properties are of a much lower standard than public sector rental properties and certainly sort of owner occupiers. So I think that data and that evidence is there. And I, I think that is a fair um, summary on my part or for analysis. Um, in, in the other question about whether landlords will bite, I think it's a very fair question it is, it, and it is one we considered. And really the, the thing that spurred this sort of, um, this bit of work that we've done and this opportunity was the very fact that many more landlords now um, appear to be looking to sell. And that was even before COVID-19 hit. And I think many of them are struggling um, with void periods or with sort of renting out uh, new properties. Um, and, you know, all sorts of chain tax changes that have happened over the, over recent years, along with um, regulatory changes. So no fault evictions, which eventually, well, we keep being promised that they'll, they'll be ended, but um, during COVID they are temporarily suspended. But, you know, once they go as well, landlords will have less power in this sort of, in this relationship. And so, some of the kind of own sort of um, landlord industry surveys have suggested that anywhere from a quarter to a third of landlords are looking to sell up. Now, at the same time, um, the access to cheap finance for, buy to, for prospective buy to let landlords is becoming much more difficult and the rate of interest they're paying is increasing. So we have a kind of potentially a perfect storm with a, a large number of landlords wanting to sell up. Um, but not very many new buy to let investors coming in or not as many. Um, and that, that space really allows a gap either for prices to fall, which would be welcome and therefore more um, first time buyers could potentially step in or given that uh, prices are still at, at very high levels in most of the country, you know, that gives an opportunity for the public sector or the, the, the social sector to step in as well, because um, borrowing for those sectors against housing, which is a pretty stable asset, is actually getting cheaper at the very same time that it's getting more expensive for buy to let landlords. So even if we don't see a great surge of landlords wanting to sell up, even the normal market sort of um, turnover rates would pro should give us an opportunity, you know, over the next couple of years to sort of pull back some of that um, stock back into the um, public or social uh, rental sector. So I think there is an opportunity, regardless of sort of, you know, even if um, there isn't a great growth of, of buy to let landlords selling up, but there is evidence to suggest that there is. And I think if, if um, a public sector buyer came along with a very easy offer, more or less at market rate, um, and kind of, you know, with no chain um, and, and a quick turnaround, I think that would be very attractive for many buy to let landlords who have kind of, who have maybe recognize the top of the market and, and want to cash in. Thank you, Martin. And uh, I think there was one question left from Craig for Amy. Hi, yeah. yeah. Um, thanks for that. Um, the housing precariousness measure was uh, originally, it was developed as a cross-European measure, so we're more interested in comparing um, the different levels of precariousness we found across countries and then also in turn the gap between owners and renters in all those countries. So it was more about demonstrating that in some countries the gap in terms of precariousness between owners and renters was very small compared to very large and others, including the UK. Um, and it was at the country level. So next, something that I'd like to do with that is take it down to the um, 
individual level and, and try and do some of the things you've talked about and make sure we control better for socioeconomic status things like that i mean we did link it to health and find that high precariousness meant uh, poor health but it was a very simple analysis so it's something that we need to develop further <laughs> thank you amy and thank you craig for the questions um adriana um you said you had a question yeah, thank you all. The presentation were absolutely amazing. And Tom, thank you for organizing this new format. I think it worked very well. I also thank you for inviting a politician. We housing researchers always try to connect our finding to the political level because that's where the change happens. So my question would be maybe directed more to Martin, but also to everybody else in the panel. We talked about what we can do. We talk about what landlords can do and Matt Howell is here representing their view, but I'm interested more in tenant activism and Steve Rolf wrote on tenant activism, if I'm right, on cash. Um, do you think that tenants own activities, you know, organized proper tenant activists, but also small scale tenant activists helps in bringing this agenda in the public space and has any effect in shifting the debate? Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Um, Martin, do you want to start off first? Yeah, just very quickly. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, inevitably, uh, or ultimately, I suppose, yes, it does. There are around 12 and a half million private renters in the UK. And when you consider the average UK government is elected by anything from 12 to 14 million voters, that represents a massive sort of political <laughs> kind of wedge, if you like. And if only those renters could all get on board the kind of the same agenda or a, a, a sort of a, a relatively focused agenda, I think it could have huge political impact nationally or locally. Um, and I think, you know, so, so it is definitely possible to do it. It's my only sort of reluctance is, or the caveat is that I think that current sort of laws and regulations generally don't favor the renter. And usually on an individual basis, um, as a renter, you have very little power. You can be kicked out of your home. Um, if you just, I mean, people have talked about rent strikes, for example, but as an individual, if you miss your rent, then the next time you, um, try and get a, a property or, or rent a property, you're going to have a black mark against you, which is going to make it more difficult for you to find a home in the future. So really the cards are all stacked against the private renters. And if you, um, if we're kind of, if we're sort of resting on them or us um, to really sort of do the running here, then I think that's a bit unfair. I mean, I think there is an opportunity to do it, but I think we need to find some clear kind of agenda or a clear sort of, um, Kind of guidance or, or line that people can take in order for that to happen i think thank you thank you martin uh, kim anybody else on the panel have any thoughts or comments as well kim? um yeah um just a few thoughts to add i mean i think if you look at the history of the private rented sector in scotland for example i think we see that the tenant voice and tenant mobilization has been important you know historically in shaping how the sector has evolved and has, has a you know, knock-on impacts on other tenures as well. Um, so I think it is really important, and Steve Rolfe, my colleague at Stillon, has, has, has done some interesting work around tenant participation, tenant activism in the PRS context. Uh, so I think it, it does make a difference. It does bring value, and I think there's been... Um, it, but it works at different scales, I suppose, is the point I was wanting to make. You know, there's been some quite helpful national campaigns about raising awareness and trying to keep issues on the political agenda, mobilising the media quite well and effectively to do that. But also, actually, I'd say at the local level, um, there's been a lot of good work that's helped um, individual tenants, you know, try and resolve some of their issues. Um, I'm thinking of organisations like Acon here, who do a lot of good work in, in their communities, supporting private renters who are maybe having struggles and challenges with their landlord. Um, so I think there's a lot of community activism and, um, that, you know, that's, that's, that's important. And actually these organisations provide a really helpful social support for other tenants, but there's also the national level. So it works at different scales, I think, about raising awareness and trying to change agendas and um, just keep issues in the spotlight. And it's not easy to do that, but I think there's a lot of organisations doing a lot of good work here. Thank you, Kim. Um, Sarah, do you have any thoughts from a sort of crisis uh, policy campaigning perspective? 
Yeah, well, uh, I mean, the, there's been plenty of research to, to, to show the impact that, that tenant activism can have. And, and it, it seems critical to, as, as part of a broader set of solutions to, to improve standards. The IPPR did some work looking at lessons from Germany and, and very strongly supported the case for, for more resources being put into supporting and growing tenant activism. But I think it's important to emphasize that, that we mustn't look at the broader structural reforms that we need. Um, it's speaking particularly about England to provide a, a solid basis for improving standards in the private rented sector. And, and first and foremost is, is getting in place a national registration system to begin the process of improving the quality of data about the sector and to enable local authorities to deliver a more effective enforcement function um, and alongside that you know we're also um, caught, we, we, we want to see the government move forward as quickly as possible with proposals to um, end section 21 um, alongside other immediate emergency reforms to to protect renters during the covid crisis from the risk of eviction as a consequence of loss of income from from covid um, and we also need to see um, improvements in affordability and, and one way of achieving that would be to introduce in-tenancy rent increases. So yes, there is a role for tenant activism definitely, but, but, uh, and, and hopefully that can also help to um, increase pressure on government to, to introduce these wider structural reforms that we, we urgently need for the sector. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Amy and Ken, do you have any thoughts or comments? Um, uh, I, well, Amy, you go first. No, I was just going to say I thought you had something to say, so carry on. Okay, well, you probably wouldn't expect me to say this, but I think, you know, uh, there are clearly huge structural imbalances of power in the private rented sector and uh, tenant activism, be it bottom-up things through Facebook, etc., which I know Adriana is very interested in, is obviously very important, but so are intermediaries who can facilitate uh, and help raise the standards in the sector as, as has just been said. So a couple of examples, uh, we are working with the Tennessee Deposit Scheme and the uh, Safe Deposit Scotland people in Scotland and we've got a three year programme about raising standards in the rental market and that's that's not just about you know talking to landlords, it's about supporting tenants to do exactly these sorts of things. But actually the thing I wanted to say uh, more specifically was I can think of an example of a social landlord in the east of Scotland who has a private renting subsidiary and it has kind of morphed into a kind of uh, a supporter and, and uh, engager and facilitator of uh, private tenants across the east of, Scot of Scotland. So they're actively encouraging people to get in touch with them through a website to find out how they can actively engage and try and improve the standards that, that people face or deal with some of the issues that, that they face. And that's, that was kind of a social housing initiative but uh, it seems to be having quite an impact. Thank you, Ken. And Amy, did you have any uh, thoughts there as well? No, I think we've been covered really well, but I think it's just showing that one of the main themes here is this power imbalance. So whether it's on an individual level, trying to just get some repairs done to your home or maintenance done to your home, or on a broader scale, trying to get bigger changes, there's just this massive power imbalance between private renters, landlords, and social policy. So. And we know about obviously politicians disproportionately being homeowners and landlords themselves. So it's going to, it's a challenge. So I think anything that contributes towards this push for a shift is a good thing. Thank you, Amy. And I think, uh, Julie, I think uh, you had some questions to the panel as well. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, brilliant. Sorry. So I've got a bundle of questions, so I apologise if this is a bit long. But um, first, Kim, I think it's really welcome to see um, some attention being paid to older people in the private rented sector. Uh, some research we did some time ago um, indicated that a real pinch point was as older people were moving into retirement. So it was the post 55 and into 65 group that we saw as being having real problems in managing that transition. So it'd be interesting to see. Um, whether you're able to expand into that group. So maybe a bit of thought on that would be interesting from you. Um, second, I think overall we're talking about the private rented sector like it's one thing. We need to start disaggregating the market because unless we disaggregate the market, we're making no sense. So um, I think in particular, so there's two or three ways in which this will help our discussion. 
First, as, as Ken sort of mentioned, um, the increasing number of housing associations that are going into the private rented sector, that are offering ASTs, that are offering rent um, market rents. What I really want to know is whether tenants in those properties feel more secure because their landlord is a housing association, despite the fact they're a private rented tenant. Is that feeling of security different because of the mode of the landlord? And that's a similar question we need to ask about the big build to rent developments. Do those tenants feel this is my home, I am feeling more secure because they feel that the landlord is a different kind of landlord. So there's a really important questions we need to ask about whether these new players in the market are creating further senses of security. And that leads to other sort of comments we need to make about how this market is morphing. This market is changing substantially at the minute. And I don't think we've got a grasp on it in this discussion. One of the things that's coming, we're talking about tenancy imbalances, is we're getting an increase in global landlordism. And that global landlordism will create different kinds of dynamic between landlords and tenants. And they're not going to be better dynamics. They're not going to, to change any of these imbalances at all. I think they're going to make them worse. Um, I think we've got questions that sit around um, improving quality of property, but nobody's as yet has talked about enforcement activity. So the presumption is that you have regulation, so landlords will change without enforcement uh, investment in the middle, nothing is going to happen. So all of our attention, if we're talking about property quality, we have to be talking about local authority enforcement activity and how we better fund that and how we better support it. So I think that's part of the discussion, I think, I'm kind of throwing into that, uh, which would be useful. And then finally, just the final point about the disaggregation. I think Martin would probably arrive at a more finessed kind of approach to his analysis if he disaggregated the market a little and looked at different markets, looks at different landlords within the market. Portfolio landlords are not going to sell up at the minute. They're not going to sell up. You might get some traction amongst landlords who are highly geared, who are finding it difficult to, to manage their one property where their tenant might be in high levels of arrears and they might look, be looking for an easy and quick and cheap way out but I'm not sure that that you're and, and actually that's not a, a small bit of the market you know I reckon that's probably a, a fifth of the market might be quite churny market that's looking at a, a reasonable way out so I think formulating an offer that's specifically for those landlords would be better than saying you know what we want to buy the whole of the PRS because that's not going to work so that's the end of my comments. Thanks, Julie. Um, and uh, I think uh, uh, we've got a presentation this afternoon um, from Jennifer Harris um, on about the compliance and enforcement activities in the private rent sector. Um, so I, I think there'll be questions in that, in that session as well that are, are there. And uh, just building on what you're saying about the different types of landlords, um, the build to rent sector as well, that there's those, sort of the advertisement that they're going into is building on that idea of home as well, using oh yes you can have pets you can have um all these different things so it it feels like that but then in terms of the regulation it is there so that would be very interesting um anybody on the panel kim do you have any thoughts yeah i'll i'll, I'll, I'll take the, the first question about age first and then maybe link to disaggregation if that's okay tom mm -hmm. so i think in terms of the age range we looked at the, the project for cash we've involved in yeah it finished uh mid 50s um, so we haven't looked yet at the older age group, post 55, 60, but I agree there's definitely something interesting there and, and the thought process is people near retirement, especially around that issue about, you know, people who've been renting long term, which many of our participants in our project were, um, and we're worried about ageing themselves at a mortgage, actually. So there's a lot, there's there's, there's issues there. And um, when another strand I'm interested in taking forward with my colleague at Stirling, Vicky McCall, is around dementia. And um, given that we have an ageing population and a growing private rented sector and more people will be renting in older age privately and dementia is obviously increasing, how do we, you know, how can we work with landlords to support them to help people age in place, which is very much the kind of policy discourse on the health side at the moment. So I think there's opportunities, you know, for the housing and health sector um, to work together around these issues because I think there's still a lot we don't know and maybe um, more sharing of kind of good practices needed to try and, and kind of get good outcomes for people. Um, and then if I move on to the disaggregation question, I think that's a really good point. Um, and definitely there's a lot of diversity here in a lot of different sub-markets and there is a good literature on that. But at the same time, um, earlier this year, myself, um, my colleague Adriana Sueta, who's in the, in the chat session, 
and another cash colleague from Glasgow, Maureen Monroe, we were involved in an international evidence review, which was looking at qualitatively tenancy experiences of, of, of the PRS and lightly regulated markets. And we looked at a lot of these different sub-markets and although we're sure there were, there were differences in, and there was particular issues for particular groups, at the same time, there was also a lot of commonality and that comes back to the presentation I was doing this morning. You still see very similar dominant themes around affordability, quality, security of tenure. But of course, these issues are much more acute for people at the bottom end of the market um, who are the most vulnerable and the most income. So I think there's particular challenges at pinch points in, in particular sub-markets, but there's also, there are still, I think, common themes that you can you can kind of trace across some of these these kind of different sub-markets as well. So it's a, yeah, it's a complex picture and you're right, we should avoid kind of over um, simplifying it. That's that's all for me, Tom. Thank you, Kim. Um, Ken, do you have any comments? Yeah, just to say, I thought what Julie said was excellent and, and really, really on, on the on the money. I suppose uh, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, I think I think the structure and the segmentation of the rental market is really cr critical, and we can argue over exactly how it works out. But what to me is important is that we believe that there are interventions we need to make, be they about non-price regulation or rental regulation. They, it needs to be it needs to be focused and forensically in the right part of that structure of the, of the system, which I guess is part of what Juliet was saying. And in, in particular, I think, you know, if you think about a literature like systems think, thinking, it talks about le le leverage points, that there are places where you intervene to have the maximum leverage. And what you want to do is not the opposite, which the danger is if you, if you have a broad brush approach, you're diluting across everything and you have a much weaker sort, sort of impact. The other thing that I thought I'd like to reflect on what Julie said was about the global landlordism point, which I guess is an extreme example, a very important example, but an extreme example of passive la la landlordism as a whole. And both cases make the role of letting agents absolutely critical, it seems to me, in how they interface with tenants. And that gets you onto the regulation of letting agents and all the issues around that. So it seems that, it seems to me that when we think about investment decisions and the behaviour of investors, and we think about the arguments for and against rent regulation, etc., we always have to think about non-price regulation and how it interacts with these things as well. So I'm just adding complexity to complexity in a sense, but I think it's a important diagnostically at least to think, think, think in those terms. Thank you, Ken. Um, Amy, do you have any comments or thoughts? Um, yeah, mine's more. I think sort of practical from a researcher perspective. So my, most of my work is based on secondary data analysis. And I think something that I feel quite strongly about is that we need the data to catch up with what we're talking about here. So at the moment, you know, if I want to analyze the relationship between tenure and health, I've got private renters, I've got social renters. I haven't got private renters who say rent from a responsive landlord, don't have a letting agent in the middle. I can't compare to people who have to go through a letting agent. People have a global, very distant, very hard to um, access landlord. And I think that's going to make a massive difference. You've also got people who rent from their parents, for example. So those experiences and how they relate to the things we're really interested in um, are going to be very different. And I think we need to try and get the data to include that a bit more. Thank you, Amy. Um, is there anything from Martin? Any further things to add? Uh, yes, please. Just a couple of points. Um, I totally agree with Julie's point about disaggregation. I mean, I guess our idea is still quite new, so we're still talking at a very high level. And much of the description is at a high level. But we completely recognise that some landlords will have you know, what you might call more patient capital than others. And so institutional investors, for example, will probably weather the storm or adapt to changing tax or regulatory um, environments. Um, smaller scale landlords, which is probably about half the market, I think are much more likely to be part of that churn that Julie described. And I do, in one of the notes in my presentation, I do accept that um, the, um, this, of the five and a half million property, vital, uh, sorry, private rental properties in the UK, our sort of proposal probably relevant to about a million of them, maybe a million and a half, so maybe 20, 25% of the market, is probably going to be part of that churn over the coming years and susceptible, or particularly susceptible to some of the, the economic difficulties and, and uh, financial and regulatory changes that are underfoot. So uh, I totally accept that point and I'm not, we're not aiming to take over the entire PRS. I think that would be a bit, <laughs> a bit too ambitious. Um, 
but I, th I think there definitely still is an opportunity to catch some of the, the kind of the low hanging fruit um, in the sector. And also, um, Sonia made a point in, in the chat or asked a question about the sort of Portuguese experience. Now, I don't know very much about it. And I'd be very happy to read uh, any, any evidence around that, Sonia, if, if it's available in English. Um, the, the, this was tried and it was found to be very expensive. I mean, our entire proposal hinges on this idea that government can access finance much more cheaply than the private sector. Now, that is true. Um, and however you structure it, that is always going to be a cheaper option than um, letting the private sector run it. And what we've seen in the UK, as I'm sure most of you are aware, but, you know, in 1980, the average renter spent about 10% of their income on rent. And now it's more like sort of 30%. So, you know, we've seen the gradual privatization of, of the rental housing stock in the UK has led to a huge increase um, in rents uh, in that period. So when we talk about affordability, it's not just about what it costs government, it's also about what it's going to cost the renter and the wider economy. And we could debate it all day. But I think overall, the principle is sound that while government can borrow at much, much lower rates than um, private investors, there is an opportunity um, to turn that around, to, so, to, to move back towards public and social housing, uh, which will cost less simply because the servicing of the debt um, to do that will cost much less. Thank you, Martin. And Sarah, do you have any final thoughts or comments? Yeah, just a couple of quick comments. I, I completely agree with, with, with Judy's points. I just wanted to pick up on a couple of them in particular. The point about the built to rent sector and the Housing Association private rent offer um, and the tenants experience of that, I think it would be really great. It's not one for crisis, but it would be really great to see some research coming out on that because those sectors are, are continuing to grow. And also we're gonna see growth in the local authority, um, non-social sector as well. So, so understanding um, the impact of, of short, shorthold tenancies and the whole kind of package uh, and experience for those tenants is important. And, and just also to agree with Julie that, that it, it was an omission not to have mentioned the, the critical role of enforcement as, as the, the package of measures that, that we need. Um, and, uh, you know, we are very clear in calling for increased investment in local authorities enforcement functions and obviously at the, given the pressure local authority resources are under at the moment it is a matter of extreme concern um, that they're being asked to do more um, at a you know increased pressure with reduced resources and that's something that really has to be looked at one of the specific recommendations that we've made um, in addition to the broad call for funding, is that the tenancy relations function that so many local authorities used to deliver is made statutory and has a, a funding stream attached to it, which is just one of, of the package of measures that would, would help to address that point. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I've got a few questions for Ken on the chat. Um, first one is from Renters' Rights London, uh, Portia. Uh, her question is, does Professor Gibb uh, have an opinion on whether the increase in bill to rent development, which is happening, will increase or decrease the potential for effective rent regulation, increased affordability? I was going to ask, ask, answer a different question about bill to rent there, actually, you kind of threw me a little bit. Uh, I think um, bill to rent is clearly a, a new segment. Uh, I, I, think, I think the problem is it kind of comes back to a prior question about what you take rent regulation to be. So are, are you talking about, for instance, a national rent control policy or are you, which might limit rent increases by TPI plus something, or are you talking about what they've tried to introduce in Scotland, these rent pressure zones, which try to pick on very specific geographies to, to increase rents? I think we'd, I think the issue must apply much more strongly for the latter case. If you, if you could imagine a rent pressure zone system working and Douglas is on the on the call here and has, and has obviously done work about rent pressure zones, they're difficult things to implement but if, if they were implementable then clearly in a local area then the existence of a major investment, built to rent investment would be very sig significant in the, in, in, the, in the impact it would have and the rents would have set but you'd have to quality adjust, you'd have to, it's not, it's not enough to say that rents are X across the board in an area, you have to take account of size and quality, units, amenity and all these things when you're thinking about 
how you go about these things. So it's not straightforwardly black or white, I think. That's really what I'm trying, I'm trying to say. It's, it's nuanced to some, to some extent. But clearly, if there's a lot of that kind of investment and it's pushing rents out of the range of people's ability, ability to pay, then you need to think about interventions about that, though not necessarily in the form of, of rent controls. So well, that's how I would answer that first question. There was another one as well, Tom, wasn't there? Yeah, you've got actually got two. Um, Sonia's asked uh, what you think about Berlin's decisions on the freezing of the PRS. I think, I think you have to take every single example of introductions and interventions and rent controls in their own context. You've got to look at the, the, the array of interventions that take place, the non-price regulations, the historical context of a market, how that market is evolving and, and changing. And you have to bear, you have to look at that. I don't really know enough about the Berlin example to, to give a carte blanche answer on it. I, I think the point of what I was, I guess, trying to say in my presentation and about how we ought to interrogate how rent, rent regulatory mechanisms work is that we need to, we need to look at them closely in terms of those key factors, the, the history, the institutions, the, the, the nature of the local market. And I was pointing at one thing in particular, which one of the other people made it, raised a question about, was the market structure and the degree of competition in that market. Because all of that long litany of evidence that America, particularly American economists have, have produced about rent controls over the years are based on very strong assumptions about uh, the competitiveness of, of, of markets. So, you know, that, that, that's, that's a really important research question seems to me, can we not have some kind of metric which helps us at particular spatial scales mm -hmm. to at least have a sense of how competitive markets are? Because, you know, you can actually say there's actually no point in taking, uh, undertaking a kind of conventional rent control exercise if actually the market looks nothing like a competitive market. If there are imperfections as you'd expect there to be, there are second best issues and other things, it starts to get much harder to, to actually in a sense, invest in a kind of research program which tries to tries to, you know, uh, basically run some run some econometric models on a on a on a fictive mar uh, market in that in that context. So that that's 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 a concern I have, I guess. And one more for you here, uh, Ken. Um, this one's from Craig. He says, uh, given your point in the conclusions of your presentation, there's a tension between uh, increasing sophisticated economic analysis and strongly held assumptions. Is there a challenge for getting these ideas across to non-economic? Well, that's that's really the point where we started the, the, the pa pa paper from. We we are interested in the sense that there are there's some evidence across economics, or broadly in the applied economics space, that uh, there's a kind of movement going on. There's something ha happening in, in the analysis. So so the, the area where it's probably clearest is in la la labour market economics, where uh, m minimum wage analysis is changing because people are stopping using assumptions about competitive markets and they're thinking about imperfect markets and, and how that changes how you go about mo modeling the thing. And we, we, we started looking at the economic theory and economy to, to see what evidence there was of that. And that, to be honest, it's disappointingly small. There's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of rigorous work going on and they are using more clever, uh, way, <coughs> inventive ways of trying to create you know, uh, uh, quasi-experimental type approaches to the impacts of changing rent controls and such like. But they're not really going that extra mile and really thinking about these kind of non-competitive market structures, which seem to me to be going, going against the reality of what most of these markets seem to be like, I think. That's a, a speculation. So, uh, so Craig's absolutely right. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a communication job done, but actually it works both ways, as these things always do. It's not simply about saying, there, is, there are these uh, difficulties in the assumptions that economists are using. I mean, first of all, there's a, there's a fundamental debate in economics about whether you can even question people's assumptions or not. So that's, that's part of the, the struggle you have to, you have to put, put up with, I guess. But actually, it's also, an, it's also a problem for non-economists as well, I think, that the, you know, we, we need to understand the good and the bad of, the, of this work. There's some really good things in the, in the, in the neoclassical economic analysis of these things, really good points about mo mo mobility, about maintenance and things like that, which aren't probably what you think they're going, going to be. Uh, but there is some stuff which I don't think is very helpful as, as well. So uh, I'm, I'm, a real, I'm a real traditional cop-out on the one hand this and on the one hand that. So I, I think it is quite complex. But uh, 
yeah, we, we need to communicate better. And one of the, one of the reasons for doing this evidence review is to try to help that process of, of communicating what the literature actually says and what it doesn't say, what we think's wrong with it, what we think it does well. Thank you, Ken. Is there any comments from anyone else on the panel? Um, no, um, so we have five minutes left. left. Uh, does anyone have any further questions? Um, If anyone wants to raise their hand, Adriana, you have a question. Um, it is more like two comments. One on Julie, who emphasized the importance of disaggregating the markets, including the type of landlord. And we had a research uh, through which we could document some of this huge diversity in landlords in the UK, you know, from small portfolio, large portfolio, and so on. But while it seemed that this is an important thing, if you look at international comparison, we see, for instance, that in Germany, like in the UK, the great majority of landlords are the same individuals, and it works. If we look in Switzerland, we see the great majority of uh, landlords are institutions, pension institutions, which means that everybody of us is a landlord through the, our pensions. It works. So I'm not sure how much it depends on the type of landlord or how much it depends on the whole organization, as Kim was saying, between labor markets for tenants, between uh, welfare system because some people are quite disparate It's the only way they can have a pension by just renting a house to someone else and my other comment was uh, regarding the work that Ken and I are doing and Ken is uh, reviewing the econometric evidence I have reviewed the social science studies and here the story is completely different here, the key question comes to be political. So there is no question that the lower uh, end of the private rental sector needs regulation because they just can't afford, but only very, very poor and substandard. Uh, and in the struggle to regulate in cities like New York and even in Germany, not the evidence mattered actually, it was the political and how the questions were framed politically. So that's it, thanks. Thank you, Adriana. Um, Alison, you've got a question. Um... Yeah, that, that, that was really interesting, Adriana. Um, I, I wanted to, my slightly different, as I wanted to have a, a question that sort of particularly relates to Amy and Martin, really, and it's about, um, um, but does follow on from Julie's point about segmentation because through a lot of the the, the conversation we've been talking, there's been um, references to tenure as an analytical tool, and I know there's been lots of sort of um, discussions about um, the utility of that in the in the sort of um, you know in in the network and housing studies re recently. But um, for Amy, I was wanted to say about you comparing owners and renters. But I was just wondering um, how you've taken um, uh, um, acknowledge the sort of selection effects that are apparent there because it's similar to all the literature lots that comes out of America about the benefits of home ownership and things but most of that comes down to um, the sort of uh, relative affluence of a lot of the, the people with within that tenure um, and a lot of people at the bottom end of the home ownership market also um, uh, experience a lot of the things that we've been talking about today amongst private renters and when we talk about um, uh, the percentage of non-decent homes and what have you within the PRS because the home ownership is so much larger tenure and um, in absolute number terms we're talking about often talking about similar populations when we're talking about different um, group so I just my question was just about how you've sort of maybe um, you know choosing similar households and then following them through the the data the longitudinal data and things to see what independent role and 
tenure has and things. So I think that might be interesting. Um, and I think would be provide stronger sort of evidence in, in terms of the, the, the effects of precarity and, and things. Um, and the other thing I wanted to um, think about with Martin, because although this, this is slightly off the PRS, but um, when you were talking, um, again, you know, a lot of the, the poor insulation and the lack of double glazing and all the rest of it is evident in home ownership and there's lots of poor quality problems there. So I was wondering what, why not, why would you not just package it as a green housing market package type thing going into a market downturn um, and having a, an emphasis on not just doing them up for social rent, which we know has happened before, but is doing them up, um, as you said, about increasing energy efficiency and things. Because again, um, you know, if we are moving into a deep sort of slump, um, you know, those sorts of properties will be coming on the market too. So it's just about the use of um, not just recognising the segmentation in uh, the PRS, but within other tenures as well, particularly home ownership. Thank you, Alison. Uh, Amy, do you want to uh, respond? Yeah, so this is a massive, massive issue with the data analysis. Um, yeah, it's just a huge challenge. Um, obviously, there's people who use, so when you talk about like, the um, effects of home ownership in the US, people move from sort of a crude analysis to including things like instrumental variables. Um, that's something I've struggled to find an equivalent for for the UK when you had the, when you're trying to compare entering into the social rented housing market as well as trying to compare to the private market or whether you go into own home ownership. Um, but I take totally agree that while we're focused here on the private rented sector, the lower end, if you like, of the market for homeowners is really poor. And that's why I really like to emphasize that home ownership isn't the answer for everyone. While we're critical of the private rented sector, that the answer isn't necessary to push everyone into ownership, which is what has been a big focus of policy making so uh, it's not finished or at a stage where it's presentable yet but i've been looking at for example right to buy and especially the later stages of right to buy where the people who are buying now are not necessarily i think it was um chef would have they've done some work looking at the expansion of the right to buy to people and they're having to they're not necessarily positioned to buy but the opportunity is there and it's hard to say no so they're having to take on extra work to uh, inflate their income for example and they're not necessarily considering or aware of or being told about the costs of house insurance and things like that and they're putting themselves in incredibly financially vulnerable positions to achieve this perceived better tenure um, but then they're experiencing like you say poor conditions they lose access to housing benefit for example so if they struggle there's not the support there to help them they, they, they lose even if it's not very well uh, enforced the right to have their landlord improve and maintain their property so I totally agree that there's differences across and uh, within the tenures. Um, in terms of what I've done, so a lot of the work has tended to focus for this reason on comparing um, private renters who receive housing benefit with those who don't, because then you can sort of look at the previous trends and see how the change in policy has shifted um, and, and, and sort of separate the impact of uh, think tenure that way. But um, so for the C-reactive protein paper, we did just use control so we did extensive controls for socioeconomic status for um in, uh, income education existing health on the um paper looking at housing arrears we limited it um to people who were in employment and tried to limit it to people who are otherwise similar we've also done checks using matching data matching and things like that to try and as best we can account for the fact that there are selection effects into the different tenures. Sorry, that was a bit long-winded. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. And uh, Martin, would you like to just briefly uh, respond? Yeah. <clears throat> um, very quickly, so I completely recognise that um, there are many kind of low-income households who are also owner-occupiers, and I think it's something, if you look at the, the, the lower sort of decile uh, of income earners, something like 10 to 20% of the bottom 10% uh, of households by income are owner occupiers. It's a bit more in the, the second decile and so on. So there is a substantial number of very low income owner occupier households, but it is already Green Party policy to 
uh, and going in, in, at the last election, it was uh, explicit that we would kind of um, subsidize or even pay for retrofitting of those homes. I guess the, the reason why we're now looking specifically at the private rental sector is because that was always a gap. Because even if you throw money at it, if you throw money at landlords, you're not guaranteed they're going to use that money or you use that opportunity to upgrade the home. And I think that's where the kind of policy gap was for us, that there was this sort of significant chunk of housing where it was much more difficult to incentivize the right behaviors or incentivize kind of better quality homes. So that's what, one of the reasons at this juncture that we're focusing on um, the private rental sector, but we are already absolutely recognize the need to support lower income owner occupiers as well in sort of, um, retrofitting or you know making their houses uh, um, their homes carbon neutral so I absolutely agree with that but our focus at the moment is just trying to fill some of the gaps that we felt existed thank you martin and uh, i'd just like to thank all of the panel uh, for attending and their contribution today and thank everyone here as well for attending and asking uh, very insightful questions to everyone um, we will put this recording of this session uh, online uh, onto the website um, and I do look forward to hopefully seeing you again at 2 p.m. We've got Susan from Homes for Good who will be uh, giving a presentation about her approach uh, with Homes for Good and what they've seen in regards to COVID-19 and we'll have the opportunity for you to ask questions to the later um, other uh, speakers who have uh, given uh, presentations as well. Uh, so just thank you all for attending and uh, hope to see you later this afternoon as well. Thanks everyone. Thanks Tom. Thanks. Thanks Tom. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Bye.